Okay, I'm finally finished with my autonomous cars episode. Now to just check the news before I hit the render button and take a big sip of coffee. So, uh, the loop is pretty much the stupidest idea I've ever personally seen go to the proof of concept stage. You know, second only to the hyperloop. So, here's how it's supposed to work. Elon Musk's boring company will dig tunnels under major cities, and you'll be able to take your car through those tunnels at high speed. The cars will be guided by little wheels on the front, which brace into a guideway in the tunnel. It's the same system as a guided bus, but it's faster. Uh, there will be a little elevator at each end, which can bring your car up and down from the tunnel system. This will once and for all fix traffic. Okay, right. There will be no chance of overcrowding in the system, because the boring company can just build more tunnels. They can do this because they will make tunneling much cheaper by means of improved tunnel boring machine technology. Elon says he wants to go 20 or 30 layers down with the tunnels. Sure. Okay. Elon expects to move 4,000 cars per hour at a speed of 150 miles per hour through each tube. Some of these cars will be pods, which will carry up to 16 people thereby making it mass transit and so affordable to the masses. Okay, right, sure. So there's something here which I want everyone to remember called AM-FM. This was originally a science fiction term referring to the difference between the boring, clunky world of actual machines and the extremely sexy, high-tech, utopian world of fucking magic. Now, the loop system works extremely well in the world of FM, but we live in the world of AM. So that's the standpoint from which we're going to talk about it. So it seems like the only guy on YouTube taking a critical look at Musk's dumb idea at all is this guy named Thunderf00T, who seems to have a bunch of videos which criticize pseudoscientific bullshit. And creationism, okay. And feminism and SJWs? And he's a Gamergate guy, too. Okay, well, he doesn't seem to like Carl of Akkad either, so uh, I guess we can say Thunderf00T is a land of contrasts. But the problem with these right-wing skeptic guys is that, you know, they're not usually so good at explaining stuff like socioeconomics or policy or history. And I guess that's why they're anti-feminist and anti-SJW. So we're going to do this here without the anti-feminist or anti-SJWist baggage. And also Anita Sarkeesian is fine. So I'm going to talk about tunnel construction, tunnel operation, and I'm going to talk about why it's important to criticize big miracle fucking magic schemes like these. Okay, so this is the part about tunnel construction and tunnel boring machines. So for a long time, you could only really tunnel through hard rock, and it was a difficult and laborious process involving lots of explosives. Soft soil tunneling was very dangerous because of the potential of cave-ins. So in 1825, a guy named Mark Brunel was working on a tunnel under the River Thames in London and invented a tunneling shield to make work safer and easier. It prevented the ceiling from collapsing while allowing workers to manually excavate through the mud under the river. It worked slowly and eventually Mark had to let his son, Isambard Kingdom Brunel, finish the work. Mark went on to be drafted by the Green Bay Packers in 1993 and participated in three Pro Bowls. He got his first and only ring in Super Bowl 44 as backup quarterback for the New Orleans Saints. Okay, so this tunneling shield was the predecessor to the modern tunnel boring machine. The first successful mechanized tunnel boring machine was invented by Major Frederick Edward Blackett Beaumont. Beaumont? I don't know how to pronounce that. In 1863, 
It was used to dig about one mile a tunnel under the English Channel before work was stopped for fear that the French would use such a tunnel to invade. This tunnel was later completed in 1994, shortly before Mark Burnell was traded to the Jacksonville Jaguars. Okay, so these machines haven't changed too much in basic concepts since the 1860s. At the front of the tunnel mooring machine is the cutting head. This is the part that digs through the ground. Cutting heads can be designed for soft soil or for hard rock or a combination of both, though that can be kind of complicated. On machines designed for very soft and especially wet soil, the cutting head may operate at a higher atmospheric pressure to prevent water from flooding the tunnel as the TBM digs forward, as well as to allow for safer maintenance of the cutting head. This requires workers working on the front of the machine to sit in a pressurization chamber on the way in and out of the front of the machine, you know, sort of like deep sea divers. So behind that there's a shield which may or may not be necessary depending on how hard the soil or rock to be cut through is. If you're digging exclusively through hard rock, you might not need it at all. Now following that are machines which automatically add the tunnel lining and usually either a conveyor belt system or a little train which carries away the spoil which is the rock or soil coming from the cutting head. So the machine cuts into the rock or soil and then shoves itself ahead and cuts into it again and you know it moves fairly slowly, right? Sometimes you gotta stop it to replace the individual little cutting wheels on a big cutting head. Sometimes you need to do other maintenance that makes it stop. A big tunnel boring machine like Bertha in Seattle, which is digging the new Alaskan Way tunnel, moves about 35 feet a day. So that's about 150 days to go a mile. So a lot of really long tunnels have multiple TBMs which approach each other from multiple access shafts so the work can be completed within a reasonable amount of time. Okay, so uh, what is the boring company claiming to change about this? They want to beat the snail, which by my math involves speeding up the tunnel boring machine until it does a mile in 34 and a half hours instead of 150 days. So, you know, something like the 35-mile Goddard Base Tunnel in Switzerland would take two months instead of ten years. Okay. The Boring Company's FAQ claims that part of this is to be achieved by building smaller diameter tunnels, but also by fiddling around with the operational specifics of the TBM and some abstract increase in power. Vegeta, what does the scouter say about his power level? It's over 9,000! What 9,000? Which, I don't know, means they'll spin the cutting head faster or something. So I don't have any super firm technical criticism here, to be honest. Uh, from a strength of material standpoint, it sounds fishy, though. Existing TBM cutting heads have expendable cutters. Those are the little guys on the front which actually cut the rock or soil or whatever. Replacing them is an extensive manual process, especially if, as mentioned before, the cutting head is pressurized owing to unfavorable soil conditions. You're working in confined spaces at high pressures with heavy and dangerous equipment, so, you know, the folks who do the work on the front of the machine get paid a lot, but also, you're spending several hours at the beginning and end of your work time uh, sitting around in a pressurization chamber, so, you know, a one-hour job has eight or nine hours of decompression or whatever. So, you need really durable cutting tools if you're going to do 150 days of work in a day and a half. So I imagine you're looking at frequent cutter replacements, possibly multiple times per 24 hours of work, and that'll dramatically increase the time to tunnel any distance. But as I said, I'm not technical enough to really say much about TBM technology or its limitations, and if they can actually dig as fast as they say they want to, then that's great. It could, you know, eventually be applied to actual useful tunneling like building sewers or subways. What's a little easier to criticize is the idea of building dozens and dozens of tunnels wherever it's required. So each of these things is a 14-foot bore that handles a single lane of traffic, right? Now, when you're tunneling, especially in an urban area, you have to deal with stuff. And that stuff is utilities, subway lines, 
other tunnels, and so on. And not all of this you can avoid simply by digging deeper. Eventually you'll hit rock that'll require a different tunnel boring machine or even outright just blasting. So if you're looking at the 150 mile an hour sustained speeds which are advertised, you need some pretty broad curves. So let me show you an example. This is the Veterans Parkway bypass around Normal, Illinois and Bloomington, Illinois. It is part of historic Route 66 and was designed before interstate highway system standards existed. And uh, that's around when we settled on speed limits of 60 to 70 miles an hour. But since this was built before, the designers planned for the future. This curve in particular is designed for 100 miles an hour. Its radius is about a mile. Now, let's overlay the Veterans Parkway curve over, say, Midtown Manhattan. You can see that if you're trying to build a curve that's capable of even 100 miles an hour, you gotta tunnel under a lot of buildings. This is a problem in a city which, say, has a lot of deep foundations, like Philadelphia, or New York City, or really anywhere with tall buildings, which, you know, is presumably where traffic relief is really needed. You pretty much have the existing street right of way to dig underneath, potentially even less than that in some areas. So broad corners for high speed operation are out of the question in dense and congested areas. In uncongested areas, you have to dig underneath buildings with shallow foundations, and uh, that causes problems because property rights are generally accepted to extend all the way to hell. That's, uh, that's the literal wording that's usually used in common law. So easements have to be acquired from all the property owners along the route, potentially a long and costly legal process. And furthermore, during this process, you got to monitor buildings and roads for subsidence, and you're not going to have perfect knowledge of soil conditions since geotechnical investigation is expensive and imperfect. So you could hit unexpected soil and rock formations which can damage or destroy your tunnel boring machine, which is what happened to the tunnel boring machine in Seattle, digging the Alaskan Way viaduct replacement. They had to dig a 120 foot shaft to lift out and replace the cutting head, which delayed the project a full two years. And uh, even then, straight up tunnel boring is the cheap part of tunneling. What drives up costs are things like caverns and shafts, so in subways that's for stations, crossovers and switches, and emergency exits, and for the loop it'll at least be for crossovers between tunnels and the car elevators and the ramps. These usually have to be mined by hand since they don't have a convenient circular cross section. Additionally, fit-out and ventilation and other work that make tunnels safe for human occupation are a very large part of the budget. So, these tunnels aren't as magic as advertised. Okay, this is the second part where we talk about operations. So, I tried to make an approximation of the loop here in city skylines. It's really just a high-speed arterial road underground. It's got ramps for entry instead of elevators since City Skylines isn't going to support making car elevators. Now, I think you all might be able to see one of the main problems here right now, but I'm first going to describe some of the safety issues before we get to the real operational issues. So Elon's idea is that 4,000 cars per hour can fit in this tunnel at a speed of 150 miles an hour. This is the easy problem. Assuming the tunneling is feasible, and there are a lot of entrances and exits, and you have some well-timed automatic merges, this is doable. The system to guide the cars is very similar to a guided bus, except that instead of a big bus that can carry a lot of people, you have a small car that can carry a very small amount of people. So, presumably the automation of the guided bus car would be much simpler than road-going autonomous vehicles, which would be expected to work in many conditions. But in addition to the easy problem, there's the hard problem, which is doing all that safely. Right, so at 4,000 cars an hour, that's a car every nine-tenths of a second. 
So they'll be spaced about 198 feet apart at 150 miles an hour. And if one of them has some kind of catastrophic failure, which requires an emergency stop, your rate of acceleration while stopping would be somewhere around 7 Gs for 9 tenths of a second to avoid hitting it. Okay, right. So this is not possible without an aircraft carrier style arrestor cable. No conventional braking system can stop that quickly. Anti-lock brakes are not. Though it's unlikely a car would have an accident that drops it from 150 mile per hour to zero in a second. It's not completely out of the question. So we have two options here, which are A, except that every accident in the loop system could easily result in a multiple car pileup at 150 miles an hour and presumably horrific loss of life and a chemical driven inferno in a confined space like the Howard Street Tunnel fire in Baltimore that burned for six days, except there would be hundreds or thousands of people in this tunnel. Or B, just assume no accidents will ever occur. The Boring Company seems to have taken the second option. The thing is that if you have 4,000 individual vehicles in the tunnel per hour, then however many points of failure on each car times 4,000 cars is how many points of failure there are in that tunnel. You know, like a battery could catch fire, or the AI screws up and does something erratic, or a tire shreds. You know how in NASCAR they switch out the tires pretty frequently? That's because tire wear increases with speed. In the loop system, the cars are intended to run on their own road tires at 150 mile per hour for a sustained period of time, or that's how it looks like at the moment. I hope you like replacing tires six or more times a year. Right, so other than safety, what other problems do we have? Uh, the big one is the capacity of the elevator system. Elon has said that the system would probably need ramps for the busiest exits, which are true. It'd probably need ramps for pretty much all the exits, in fact. So your issue here is going to be queuing in the tunnels and on the surface for the elevators. Uh, you got to get the car on the elevator, get the car to the surface, and then get the car off the elevator, which then either accepts another car for pickup or goes back down to pick up another car at the bottom. So, generously speaking, that might take about 30 seconds from the tunnel to the surface, which gives you 60 cars per hour per elevator each way as a theoretical maximum capacity. Now, in actuality, it'd probably be fewer since not all cars can pull into traffic immediately and, you know, they might block the elevator platform for a bit. You know, if you got a traffic jam or something. So, 60 cars an hour is a lot less than 4,000 cars an hour. Getting cars in and out of the system with only elevators to where the system reaches anywhere close to its maximum capacity would require 150 elevators at each end. Now, presumably there'll be some ramps then, which require a bunch more real estate. That real estate is, of course, at a premium in downtowns, where most of the traffic would be. So, the elevator idea, which was designed to conserve space, doesn't work in high traffic areas where the space is most at a premium. Right. Okay. Oh, and by the way, those 150 elevators would probably displace about 300 surface parking spots at minimum which I'm sure would go over well with the neighbors. That's to say nothing of the infrastructure for connecting all 150 elevators to the loop or uh, space for accelerating and decelerating the car so they can join the uh, bunch of cars going through the fast tunnel. So we're stuck with ramps mostly, which means effectively there's no functional difference between the loop system and a conventional urban freeway other than the guidance and the speed. Each ramp is going to act nearly exactly like a freeway ramp, which means it's going to be subject to the congestion on the streets that it links up to, like any other freeway ramp. The way these tunnels are going to exit, it's not going to look like a little discrete one-lane ramp. It's going to be a heavy-duty thing that needs to dump 1,500 cars an hour onto local streets, so it'll need to fan out into multiple turn lanes and probably involve a signalized intersection. 
Now, one thing Elon mentioned was that the loop could empty directly into parking garages. This is a good idea, but it requires a lot of coordination. It's not much use for you if the building next door to yours has a loop connection to its garage, but you can only validate parking in your own building. You'll have to use surface streets to avoid the extra charge. So you're back at square one where you have to widen the streets that are connected to the loop, and that means demolitions and property line alterations for right-of-way acquisition, which no one wants or needs, and which is especially impractical in built-up urban areas. Okay, so it's hard to simulate heavy traffic in city skylines because of the agent limit. So for perspective, this is the Ben Franklin Bridge in Philadelphia. According to traffic counts from the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission, this bridge moves 2,880 vehicles westbound during the peak of the morning rush hour. So, how much infrastructure is required to move 2,880 cars off the bridge? It's a shitload, as it turns out. The infrastructure to move cars off the bridge takes up a full two and three quarters blocks around Franklin Square, all of which were previously occupied by buildings. There are multiple bridges and ramps and signalized intersections which bring these cars onto surface streets, and yet it still backs up during the morning rush hour. And this is because no matter how much heavy highway infrastructure you build, it doesn't change the dimensions of the streets you're emptying the cars onto. You know, there's only so many cars you can cram onto, say, Juniper Street. So at best, I imagine a real-life loop system would effectively serve as an urban highway, which may be very fast in certain spots, but very slow in others, especially near entrances and exits. You know, like a regular highway. Um, it'll be more expensive to maintain and build, though, and presumably will have user fees attached. It'll be limited to whatever vehicles Elon decrees are safe to run in the tunnels. Uh, transit vehicles may be included, but they'll be subject to the same delays in the tunnel that regular automobiles are, and thus there's not going to be a huge amount of incentive to use them. You know, sort of like a regular bus on a regular highway. This is the best case scenario, I think. And for this immense effort, you got a system with potentially a slightly higher capacity per tube than a regular subway line. And that's assuming, you know, all the 4,000 cars an hour are moving smoothly and are fully occupied. Which, again, they may very well not be, depending on traffic conditions at the exits. Now, subways don't have that problem, right? Since they just run from station to station and they don't have to deal with any traffic they aren't scheduled to encounter. People exit and enter the system via this high-tech technology called uh, stairs or escalators. Or elevators, because ADA accessibility is important. Um, but they don't need to drag two tons of metal with them on a ramp or giant elevator to go down to take the subway. Okay, so let's talk about how the loop and assorted adjacent projects are affecting policy. Uh, now, first off, you should be highly suspicious of any privately owned public transportation scheme. Uh, wh why is this? The answer is, of course, because of capitalism. Goal number one of any private corporation is to make money. This is no matter how generous or altruistic the upper management says they are, or even how genuinely concerned with public good they might be. Why is this? Because they're not in charge. Upper management reports the CEO, the CEO reports the board of directors. And the board of directors is appointed by the investors. And, and investors are really only concerned with profit, right? If you have a 401k or IRA or a pension, you're generally not really interested in how each individual company you own stock in is serving the public or whatever. You want returns. So with that in mind, the private sector can only provide transportation in areas where there's substantial profit to be extracted from the passengers. You know, that's one of the reasons why there's been a grand total of two new regularly scheduled private passenger rail ventures since 1971. There's 
bright line from Miami to West Palm Beach, which is mostly a real estate venture, and the auto train, which went bust and was picked up by Amtrak. Most other private ventures, you know, the Texas Bullet Train, the Desert Express, and so on have yet to lay a single mile of track or run a single train despite existing for a decade or more. Effectively, if you want to run high-speed, high-quality service between cities without government funding, you need to pick the areas with the highest incomes and the greatest populations, which have easily available room for the infrastructure needed. And that's what Brightline did. They were owned by the Florida East Coast Railroad, which owns the tracks on which the Brightline trains run, which travel through a large number of dense, wealthy communities. And the Florida East Coast Railroad owned some very large parking lots in downtown Miami on the site of its former railroad depot, of course. But this is very much an exception. Very few areas like that exist. So the rest of us get Greyhound, which, you know, can operate in many places at a profit because the government pays for its infrastructure. Backers of privately owned transportation or, you know, privatization in general call private industries inability to serve underprivileged or otherwise expensive to serve communities and markets efficiency. Efficiency and inefficiency ultimately tend to come down to what can make a profit for the shareholders in privatization discussions. But one of the problems with publicly owned transportation infrastructure is that while we live in the AM world, our politics can and do usually operate in the much more appealing FM world. And this, uh, this happens on the left and the right. So, like, saying we'll stop undocumented immigration with the wall, for instance, is fucking magic. Or, say, a Green New Deal that proposes to solve climate change by just giving everyone an electric car and which doesn't address our unsustainable energy-intensive land use policies is fucking magic. So, uh, politicians are pitched FM solutions to AM problems by both activists and private industry. Popular media is generally not smart, or at least not technical enough, to uh, call out a fucking magic solution for what it is. So these projects are accepted uncritically a lot of the times, except for some folks with technical knowledge and a few angry internet guys like myself. Even planning departments who ought to know better will go with it sometimes. Uh, you know, for instance, Miami's current mayor ran on a platform of getting more rail lines built. Then he pivoted to a policy of wait and see if autonomous cars get us out of this mess after the election, once he realized he could get away with saying fucking magic would solve the problem. Now, obviously disregarding transit in favor of autonomous cars is pretty bad, but that ain't the only way that fucking magic solutions present themselves. So, the loop and other projects like it fall into a category of transit called gadget bonds. Now, that comes from Anton Dubrow's Cat Bus blog, though I learned it from Alan Levy's Pedestrian Observations blog. Both are, you know, pretty good, and you should go read them. I'll put some relevant posts in the description. Anyway... So, gadget bond comes from gadget, and the German word for road or railroad, which is bond. So, there have been many proposals for gadget bonds in the past. I know they're all different. They all share one thing in common. They aren't trains. And usually their backers go to great lengths to explain just how much they aren't a train, how trains have nothing on them, how uh, if you're traveling into Gadget Bond, you won't feel like you're on a train, or how they've never even heard of trains before. But, crucially, Gadget Bonds aim to fill the same niche as trains do, and as a result, they have nearly all the infrastructural and operational constraints that trains have. Because, you know, as it turns out, 
basically every kind of high-speed guideway has one thing in common. Low tolerances. So you need wide curves, both horizontal and vertical. Very straight and level track, which can be only millimeters off over dozens of miles. Uh, your guideway could be a monorail, a guided busway with cars in it, a maglev, a hyperloop, or something exotic we haven't heard of, or whatever. The geometry of the right-of-way is what drives up costs, not the cost of constructing the guideway in that right-of-way. The loop simply happens to use cars instead of transit vehicles and has a lot of techno-miracle merging involved. Otherwise, it fits in the same category as the Wuppertal monorail, Morgantown, West Virginia's personal rapid transit system, and the Port Authority of Allegheny County's Skybus. These are things which were not trains, primarily for the sake of not being trains. Now, the nice thing about marketing gadget bonds is, uh, unlike trains, most gadget bonds only exist in renders and on spreadsheets. And stuff costs a lot less to construct in renders and on spreadsheets. So you can easily tout your gadget bond's low cost of construction because all your construction cost estimates exist exclusively on spreadsheets, while the established contractors with decades of experience building rail lines have to use, you know, actual numbers which were determined from prior projects that actually happened. So proven practical solutions to transportation are discarded in the presence of a potential fucking magic solution like the loop. Three loop projects are already at least in the permitting stage. There's one between Baltimore and Washington DC, there's one between Block 37 in Chicago and O'Hare Airport, and there's one between Dodger Stadium and the Los Angeles Metro Station. Uh, already one of them is replacing a viable conventional rail transportation project that would have been some kind of express L service to O'Hare Airport. Another aspect of this is something called fear, uncertainty, and doubt, or FUD. And I bring it up only because a gentleman on Twitter brought it up first in defense of Tesla. So, uh, this was originally an open source software community term for, like, what Microsoft did to undermine the spread of Linux in business and consumer computers. 2019 will be the year of Linux on the desktop. But, uh, this is definitely also a thing which is being employed by Tesla and other similar companies to undermine investment in public transit. Why invest in trains today when you might have ultra-efficient self-driving cars tomorrow? And it's notable that the biggest backers of self-driving cars uh, replacing transit uh, are the same people who make a lot of money from selling cars or at least operating them. So encouraging politicians and planners to avoid long-term investments in public transportation in favor of the status quo of car dependency is clearly in their own self-interest. In the real world, as we hurtle towards a climate disaster, we can't really afford to increase dependence on the automobile. Cars, even electric ones, have far higher energy requirements than almost any other form of transportation per, you know, person mile, simply due to the inefficiencies involved in having one motor hauling around two tons of metal for every 1.56 people. That's the average occupancy of a motor vehicle. Uh, what we need is public transportation, and we need public transportation which is accessible to all, which is fast, frequent, that goes where people need to go, and which is publicly owned. And the challenges to overcome and implement better public transit are entirely political in nature. You know, no, no one has to reinvent the train. But uh, politicians don't generally understand this. They don't use public transportation like you and I as a general rule, and thus, you know, they don't intuitively understand the problems and solutions which are needed and which are practical to implement. Hence, you know, we get fucking magic solutions. So, 
they have to be made to understand. If that means just sitting outside their office and screaming, build a fucking train at them, then so be it. I'm no expert on organizing for better transit in every area. Transit is very much a local issue. Though there's no realistic solution that doesn't involve a level of federal funding similar to what the interstate highway system receives. So, you know, find your local transit advocacy group or your riders union and find out what they're up to. You may find yourself in strange company, even with liberals. But uh, that's probably fine as long as you don't fall prey to their mostly garbage ideology. Now, as for the loop, I think one or two might get built. I think they'll have enough problems that they won't be in service for long. Luckily, Elon has built his tunnels 14 feet wide, which is exactly the same diameter as London's deep level tube lines. With a little modification and presumably some moderately expensive excavation, they could be repurposed for real rapid transit after falling into public ownership. So maybe some good might come out of it. But a successful loop system is not something to hope for. It's uh, just another freeway. And no freeway is ever fixed traffic, as Elon purports to want to do. If we want to address the oncoming climate disaster, we need public transportation, we need lots of it, and we need it quickly. We can't rely on fucking magic to solve our problems. We need actual machines. Okay, that was the episode, so here is the commercial. The first bonus episode, Unkilldozer, is up now. You have to give me a dollar on Patreon in order to see that episode. Or you could pirate it, I guess. But if your time is worth 15 bucks an hour, and it takes you more than four minutes to find a link to it, you're getting ripped off. That Patreon link is in the description, as is a buy me a coffee link if you don't want to do monthly support, but you don't get the bonus episodes there. And uh, I guess I gotta do another bonus episode soon. My schedule is a little screwed up right now, and I don't think that'll happen until late January to early February. It'll be on the Boston Molasses disaster, since I'm gonna keep the bonus episodes kinda light and frivolous, while anything with social impact will be free. Furthermore, we are closing in on the lobster guy in the Graftrion rankings. We got 3,000 Patreons to go as I record this, so please give me a dollar, if only to prove the supremacy of postmodern cultural Marxism over whatever it is that Jordan Peterson does. I, I don't know much about that guy. I heard it has something to do with cleaning rooms and misgendering people. So I, I think he runs some kind of transphobic maid service. Through Patreon, I guess? I don't know. It's really popular for some reason. Uh, and the t-shirts are now available. The link's in the description. Thanks to Jeremy Hammond from the Ballin' Out Super Podcast, America's number one leftist anime podcast, for designing them. I think if you buy one, I get like five bucks. And uh, follow me on the Twitter at Do Not Eat One. Or if you don't like all the Nazis that are allowed on the bird site, Follow me on Mastodon at do not eat at mastodon.social. Okay, here are the credits. Mm -hmm.